Hello everyone, welcome to this video where we're going to discuss how to make a more realistic SimBrief OFP, which of course stands for Operational Flight Plan. So in the previous tutorials where we went through the PMDG, how to get from A to B, we used the flight planning software SimBrief, of course, to create a flight plan. But uh, in doing so, we filled out the, only the basics. SimBrief is very good at uh, preparing automated routes, automated alternate airports, automated fuel, automated flight levels, but it doesn't always take into account certain operational uh, impacts that you might want to take into account when creating your flight plan. So in this video we're going to discuss how we can make a more realistic flight plan, the sort of things that we can change within uh, SimBrief, but also then how we can read that OFP, what sort of data we can get out of it, um, how we can look at some NOTAMs at airports, etc. And just make sure that you're sort of well briefed for a flight. So today uh, we'll pre prepare a flight uh, from uh, Heathrow to uh, Iceland, in this case uh, Keflavik. Um, and uh, we'll be using the PMDG 737-800. We won't actually be flying it, of course. We'll just prepare the OFP and brief ourselves as if we were going to do this flight. So uh, let's go to SimBrief here, of course. And we go to Dispatch, of course. And we go to New Flight. Okay, so the first box, of course, as we did previously, is BVI. The next box will be two Delta Whiskey for our identifier. The next box will be Echo Golf Lena Lima. And the next box will be Bravo India Kilo Oxtrot. Okay, so that's all well and good. And uh, the next thing we need to do is our aircraft type. You can see the next box here is actually alternate, although that won't fill out until we fill out our aircraft type. So let's go here and let's go expand this. We'll choose the 738. There is something else you can do with your aircraft type, and that is choose the custom-made PMDG profiles that SimBrief has uh, for your aircraft. So if you go down here, vary into airframe, and we go to this box, default. I'll also just turn my screen up a little bit. Uh, if we go to this box, we can see we're on the default 737-800 profile. So if we expand this, we have the PMDG MSFS first class config. Same thing, but with the economy uh, config. Uh, the Boeing Converter Freighter. And the Special Freighter. So we will do the MSFS PMDG uh, economy uh, config, which is the basically the default what you'll be flying if you're just flying the regular 800. PMDG, MSFS, economy, config, credit, four of six. There we go. PMDG, MSFS, right, so then if we go back up, this is where we start to get into looking at the flight plan. So, SimBrief has given us an alternate of EIKN airport. Which I believe is a uh, knock in Ireland. Let's check. I think that's what it is. Yeah, West Ireland, West Knock. Okay. Uh, the reason being, of course, that uh, yeah. So if you go, the the part of the reason I chose this flight is is because there is some interesting fuel uh, things to to take into account. Because if you go over to Keflavik. Often your closest alternate is essentially back within the UK. Uh, it could be Edinburgh. It could be, as it's chosen here, Knock. Uh, it could be uh, uh, Dublin or whatever. We'll have a little look. So that is automated. But this is actually a combo box, so we can expand it. We can look. As you see, we've got 13 options here. So we've got some other suitable airports. So how do we know which to choose? Well, SimBrief makes the choice for us here, but we have to consider some operational uh, impacts, right? So Knock, I believe, does have an ILS, okay, but it's quite a small airport. So 
if we were doing this flight as a, as a real life flight, whether we would want to divert back to Nock, I'm not too sure. OK, it would be. Yeah, it would be quite small. OK, so let's have a look what else we have here. So we've got EGPK, G -G okay, which is uh, Prestwick, Glasgow Prestwick. Uh, that would also be uh, suitable, but it's mainly a cargo hub. And okay, we have uh, e -N -A -L. that, uh, E-N-A-L, which is in Norway. E uh, Shannon there. E -N -N. E -N -N uh, Northern Norway, e -N -N I believe. Uh, it's Bergen. E -N -K -B uh, Northern Norway Airport, uh, Dublin, and uh, BGSF, which is uh, Greenland, I believe. Okay, um, so you could choose these. Another thing we could do is have a little look at the weather. So let's let's go here. So let's have a look. E I K N Meta, because it's not just about. Yes, if we go a little bit further to the uh, alternate, we'll have to burn more fuel, but uh, that's okay. If we can see that uh, the winds are really favouring a particular alternate, then that's probably what we'll go for. Okay, so it's a bit cloudy, but the winds look good. Fair enough. Okay, uh, we could also look at EGPK. EK Meta. So two, uh, it's variable. Two clouds. Clouds. Okay, so it's really very similar. There, wind is slightly less, but nothing major. So, um, I would say uh, knock will probably be okay. Uh, Glasgow Presswick would probably be okay. Uh, let's have a look at Dublin because see, the thing is, uh, you can also think about uh, how well you know the airports. And uh, obviously, I know Dublin quite well. I've flown there a lot, so we may say actually, let's just go as uh, with Dublin as our alternate. Have a look here. So uh, yeah, light rain mist. Light rain mist. So very similar. Seven knots, zero seven zero, yeah. Visibility. Visibility. Ceiling. So okay, so it does have a ceiling of seven hundred feet. So visibility, uh, cloud layers as well are slightly worse here in Dublin compared to uh, Knock and uh, Presswick. So we could uh, consider that as a a bit of a negative uh, factor towards Dublin. However, of course, we are a blind pilot, so. Uh, we will be using ILS uh, Autoland, so really doesn't matter too much. Okay, we don't care about the, the, the graphics. Uh, the winds were, I believe, on the 7 knots. Yeah, so we were quite variable uh, at 7 knots. So, after looking at that, you will have to decide. Uh, for this flight, I think we will go with uh, Nock. I think that looks okay. Uh, I don't know the airport particularly well, but I believe it has an ILS. Uh, the winds look absolutely fine. Um, but you could make a decision and say, OK, I know Dublin far better. I would prefer to go there. You could also make a case and say, uh, you know, Presswick. Um, of course, there are all these uh, airports in Norway as well. Uh, those I don't know as well, uh, particularly. So uh, I think we will stick with Knock. But we can actually have several alternates on the flight plan to choose, and I will show you how we can do that. So we will just go here. Yeah. Here we go. So we'll leave Knock as the alternate for this particular flight. Uh, the departure time. So this is uh, in uh, Zulu time, and you can see it will auto generate a departure time for you. So currently, uh, the time is, let's have a look, what are we Zulu? Uh, 14.52 is Zulu. So uh, that uh, has us departing at uh, 15.20. Yeah. So this is, uh, you can change this. If you change it quite significantly, Simbrief will recalculate. Uh, we will put it maybe just a little bit ahead. So maybe like 1540. Okay. 
the uh, aircraft uh, we already did yeah. uh, we already looked at this okay. so the climb profile uh, is not possible to change here because uh, it's also dependent on this the cruise profile so it's currently on ci which is cost index and simbrief will calculate a cost index or further down you can enter your own but if you decide and this is especially useful for maybe oceanic that you would like to go with a particular Mac, you can do that here. So let's have a little look. So we can choose to go at Mac 0.76, 7, 7, 7, 9 up, 8, or LRC, which is long range cruise, which is actually also an option in the PMDG's FMC. You can go into the cruise page and you can tell it to go to long range cruise. Um, let's uh let's leave it on cost index for now because it's quite a it's not a particularly long flight or we're not really going over any uh you know, crossing the atlantic or something so maintaining a, a set mac is not all that important to us but uh yeah, it's there so we can actually put in a cost index here um so we can tell it or we can leave it on auto i will go in here and i will set it to uh let's say 50. okay that's that will work Combo box collapse 78 slash 280 slash 250. Heading level 2 fuel factor. Heading level 2 fuel. Fuel factor. Um, this is if you know that your aircraft is burning more fuel or less fuel than within the Simbrief profile. That's particularly useful for freeware aircraft. Um, or maybe uh, it's also useful if uh, you have some sort of uh, issue with your aircraft that means it's going to burn more fuel. Uh, but generally, uh, unless you've got failures on. Uh, apologies for that. Uh, unless you've got failures on, you probably won't have that happen with the MDG. So, but yes, you could go here. You can see it's on P00, which is basically just following the profile. But uh, you can go here. You can go minus uh, percent on the fuel, or you can go plus. So if you're in a freeware aircraft, for example, with uh, P3D or whatever, and uh, it had a bit of a dodgy fuel burn, you could go there and you could you know, test out some different percentages until you found what the uh, correct value would be. ATC call sign. So obviously some flights, especially in Europe, have a uh, call sign that is different to the flight number. So you can go there and put that in for the OFP. Uh, we don't really care about that. Again, uh, registration. Obviously, this is set it to for the profile PMDG 738, which is obviously not a valid registration, but you could if you were flying a real world aircraft or indeed a BVI virtual aircraft, you could go there and you could put in the real world registration. Again, it doesn't really make much of a difference, but it just makes the paperwork look, to, uh, look a bit more realistic, I guess. Level two, fin number. If your aircraft has a fin number or a cell cal, you can put that there. Heading level one selections. Heading level one links eight default. Uh, for those who don't know, particularly with cell cal, cell cal is uh, more of an oceanic uh, thing as well. Uh, particular aircraft have a particular cell cal, or if you're flying an event like Cross the Pond, you will be given a cell cal, which is normally four letters, uh, and that will be uh, put into vPilot, and it allows them to basically contact you uh, with an alert over, over vPilot uh, with your particular cell cal code so that you don't have to have HF radio turned all the way up. So you could put that there in your RFP, again, just to sort of make the the output look a bit more realistic, but uh, yeah, we don't have that uh, today. We don't need it. Heading level one, pandemic. Heading level two, OFP layout. Combo box collapse, Lido. So the OFP layout, uh, by default, we use Lido or Lido. Uh, there are all sorts of layouts in here. You can say so AL, American, uh, ACA, Air Canada, etc. So you can go and actually choose a particular airline uh, OFP layout. Um, we are familiar with Lido, so we'll use Lido, but yeah, you could try that out. level two, an ERAC cycle, so this is where if you're using a previous ERAC cycle, for me, because I have it linked up to Navigraph, it's defaulted to the latest ERAC cycle, but if you're using a, uh, an old ERAC cycle, you can go in there and you can wind it back to whatever that ERAC cycle is, and in that way, you will have your route recalculated, etc. Heading level two units. Heading level two. Units, of course, and flight maps. So detailed flight maps, uh, we don't really care. They, they don't make much difference, but so there we go. Um, and then we go down here. I don't know where. Let's have a look. Oh, okay, it jumped over the combo box for units. There we go. Pounds is what I have it on by default, but you could also use kilos. There we go. 
Right, here we go. So this is where we can look at the fuel. Level two minutes. So 20. Slash. 20 for the taxi out, apparently, uh, at Heathrow. Eight. And 8 minutes for the taxi in at Keflavik. Um, right, so this is an uh, auto calculator based on the expected taxi routing and expected delays and the size of the airport. So one of the things you could consider is as a blind pilot, of course, we will not need the taxi fuel. So we can note that we essentially have 28 minutes of extra fuel. So the question is sort of, should you come in here and get rid of this? Should you set it to zero or whatever? Well, I normally just leave it. The thing to consider is you will probably have to hold, especially on Batsim with the engine running, you'll probably have to hold for the reposition. So that will eat into some of that taxi fuel. Maybe not 20 minutes, say at Heathrow, probably won't use all of that, but it's it's some of it will be used. And uh, it just gives you a little bit of an extra buffer on the fuel, right? So if we use, say, 10, 15 minutes to hold at Heathrow, um, we know that we've still got an extra sort of 10, 15 minutes left over from Heathrow that uh, we can use in the air. And of course, that is calculated purely based on taxi. So the fact that it's 20 minutes extra taxi fuel does not mean that it's 20 minutes extra air fuel. Uh, for us, uh, it will probably be a lot less. So it's probably quite negligible. Uh, really, if uh, you know, in terms of the overall uh, fuel, but uh, yeah, I would normally leave it there, especially for a busy man. Heading level two, flight rules. Combo box collapsed. IFR. So uh, flight rules, obviously, we are IFR. Um, type of flight is scheduled. You can actually go in there and change it to. Uh, I believe it's called uh, training, so that will uh, get rid of all the passengers, whatever. Uh, military, obviously, no. Uh, general aviation, no. Uh, I don't know what the difference is between non-scheduled and scheduled, to be honest with you, but yeah. Or in terms of what Simbrief will actually do, if you change that, I have no idea. Uh, here we go, so alternates count. So one, so we chose knock as our alternate, and that was our only alternate. Um, if, for whatever reason, you think, uh, well, uh, the weather is pretty bad and uh, I would like multiple uh, alternates, uh, you can set this, uh, as we go here, look, we can set this to four uh, as a maximum. We will go with two. So it will automatically choose another alternate for us and it will put another alternate routing on our flight plan and make sure that we have the fuel to get there. So, yeah, if the weather is particularly bad or it's a busy VATSIM event and you think there's a real potential that you could have to divert, you can uh, have multiple alternates there. So, yeah. We will see that in the OFP. Uh, detailed nav log, yes. Uh, ETOPS planning. So, we'll just leave all of these on. A lot of them you won't need, so we won't need ETOPS today. Uh, obviously, planned step climbs, yes. Uh, runway analysis, yes, obviously, we want that. Include no TAMs. That's notices to air missions. Uh, yes, we want that on the flight plan because we can look through that later. FIR notems. That's if there's any particular notems for the FIRs that you'll fly through. Uh, usually things to do with, well, for example, recently there's been a lot of notems for FIRs warning of GPS spoofing. Uh, so that that is that. Okay, so some optional entries. Schedule block time. Schedule block time. Three hours, 15 minutes. Uh, so I don't really know why you'd want to just that, but maybe if you knew there was going to be a particular delay, you could adjust that. Um, departure runway will automatically be chosen. So 09 are right. So uh, how can we also check that we have the correct runways for our route? Well, one of the things we can do is go to this website, uh, which is Flight Sim Aetis. Report. Uh, it's a website that shows you some of the real world ATISs. Uh, it doesn't always have every airport, uh, but it's the best you're going to get really in uh, Europe. Uh, so if we go here, search airport, we go EGLL, one result is available, arrow down to EGLL, hit enter. It usually shows me the arrival, but from that I can work out the departure. Let's see. Ah, well, as you can see here, that ATIS has not been updated in quite a while. Uh, one day, uh, 22 uh, hours ago. Um, so uh, we will disregard that. Um, I think, uh, but yes, we'll have to uh, trust Simbrief. Uh, let's see if we look at this here. Uh, it's the departure ATIS uh, information pop up, but it's uh, 
this has run my 2.7 ride, but this is, yeah, this is uh, pretty much two days old. So, um, yeah, well, okay, we'll disregard that. Normally, it has it, the ATUS from a few hours ago, but clearly they haven't updated that, so that's a bit rubbish. Um, assume they do not have uh, Okay, well, so we will have to trust Simbrief when it says 0 9 are right. Unfortunately, there's no other way to check, but if you were going to be on VATSIM, obviously, uh, we'll see. There may be a VATSIM ATUS for us to check. And then arrival, it's chosen 0 1. Let's have a look here as well. Uh, if there is a. Uh, uh, let's have a little look. There is a BIKF uh, ATIS. Uh, well, there is. Uh, oh dear, this is one day. <laughs> so obviously, their website is having some issues. It hasn't updated today. Um, we can have a look at the BIKF meta just to check as well. So this is why as well I took the alternate fuel because you can see here Keflavik is normally pretty uh, dodgy weather-wise. It's 4 degrees. The visibility is good but it's the winds here. Let's have a look. So 020 and 24. Um, so pretty windy within with limits for the 737. The crosswind limit for the 737 is 33 knots. This is a uh, Pretty much a direct wind down the runway, so it shouldn't cause too many issues, but uh, yeah, so uh, it will be zero one that uh, confirms that for us. Altitude, I will just leave on auto and we'll see what it comes up with. Uh, freight, so, oh sorry, we missed that, passengers here. So you can see here, uh, max value is 184, it will be on auto, you can come here. And you can adjust this, so you can have no passengers, or you can tell it full, uh, or you could enter a number. We'll just leave it on auto. Same with the freight. So here, you can go in there, you can tell it no freight, you can tell it uh, full, uh, or you can add extra there. Payload. Um, we can also tell it there. You can see it shows you the max payload. And, uh, yeah, so... That's okay, we don't need to uh, adjust that, we'll just leave it, we can sort that out. Zero fuel weight though, again here, uh, you can come in here, you can tell it uh, the minimum, you can tell it the max, you can adjust the zero fuel weight and it will adjust the passenger count, etc. Uh, accordingly, uh, to make it all legal. Um, we'll leave it though, don't really care. Right, fuel planning, this is the uh, interesting part as well. Contingency fuel. Let's have a look what we have here. So uh, most airlines contingency uh, have a rule where they have to have 3% fuel or 15 minutes uh, as contingency. Uh, so we will go with that or you can leave it on auto but you can see you've got a whole bunch of stuff here. 5% or 10 minutes. 5% so it will calculate whatever is, is uh, closest either the percentage or the uh, minutes. Um, so we'll do 3% or 15 minutes. Heading level two reserve fuel. Reserve fuel. So this is your. You can see there's FAA, domestic, etc. Um, again, most of the, most of the time we'll just leave this on uh, auto. Um, this is. Uh, Partly your reserve fuel is for, for missed approaches and things like that. Um, reserve fuel is not normally uh, your alternate fuel. That will be calculated separately. Um, so you could add additional fuel here uh, for your uh, airport, uh, your destination, if you thought that there was a chance that you would need extra fuel. I will leave this on auto because I'm going to add some extra fuel elsewhere. Taxi fuel will leave on auto. We've already discussed. Block fuel, again, you could tell it your total block fuel that you want to take. Maybe you're tankering some fuel, uh, you could do that. Arrival fuel, again, here, so if you have a specific amount that you'd like to have on arrival, you can tell it. Uh, MEL fuel, that is to do with the minimum equipment list that is required for your aircraft. So if there is a particular item that uh, is, for example, uh, 
not available on your aircraft uh, and you need extra fuel because of it, um, you could do that here. ATC fuel, so this is if you expect that there will be sort of en route ATC delays, deviations or whatever, um, so we'll leave that. Uh, WXX, so this is weather fuel, so if you expect there to be en route deviations due to weather, you could add some extra fuel. Um, there you go. So you can set that here. Um, you can actually choose whether you want it in pounds or in minutes. Um, and then you've got extra fuel. Tankering fuel. Which we've talked about. That's if you're taking fuel for your, uh, let's say the, the, the price of fuel or whatever, if we were simulating that, uh, at the uh, destination is really high and your airline says, okay, uh, you can take some extra fuel and then you won't have to uh, uplift fuel at your destination. I do like this extra fuel here. Uh, so as it says for forecast, no, no forecast is delays. So you can actually choose with this extra fuel I like to set it to minutes and then tell it how many minutes extra I would like. So we can consider why would we need extra fuel today? Well, um, we might need a bit of extra fuel to do a go around, uh, several missed approaches actually, at uh, Keflavik because of the wind. Um, we could say, well, the issue is if we have to divert from Keflavik, we have to come all the way back. Uh, pretty much uh, to one of our alternates, Knock or uh, Presswick or whatever. Uh, it's quite a way. It's quite a, a wasted flight if we have to do that. So maybe we say, OK, let's take some extra fuel so that if we have to do a, a couple of missed approaches, like two missed approaches, we can do that safely at least um, and we will not be stuck. Because the issue that you have is that a lot of the uh, fuel Remember when we set the uh, contingency fuel to 15 minutes uh, or whatever, you always have to land with at least 15 minutes of fuel on board the aircraft wherever you touch down. So uh, pretty much uh, in most areas of the world. So it's not like you can land uh, almost close to zero and be like, yeah, we made it. This is great. No, you have to have always uh, at least 15 minutes of fuel. So that is fuel that you're not actually supposed to touch. You're not supposed to use that fuel. Uh, if you get into the the the, the, the 50 minutes of uh, uh, final fuel, um, something's gone majorly wrong. That is like major emergency. You would be declaring a mayday and uh, yeah, whatever. Uh, so you're supposed to keep that uh, fuel untouched. So extra fuel, let's say we take an extra 30 minutes of fuel, right? So that gives us probably three missed approaches at uh, Keflavik. If we're not able to get it done there, uh, then we will have to just give up. And that's not to mention that Simbrief already did uh, put the uh, some other reserve fuel in there as well. Uh, not the contingency, but the reserve. It did put reserve. So we've just added an extra 30 minutes on top of that, basically. So, um, yeah. So we should have plenty of fuel, and then we have to come back to our alternate if we can't get in at that point. Uh, we're not tankering any fuel, so that's all okay. Uh, a lot of this we don't care about. Obviously, pilot ID, it's got that from my Simbrief. Captain's name, uh, it's got my name in there from my Simbrief profile as well. Uh, dispatcher name, uh, it's just put a random name or it will do. Uh, or we could, uh, we could give it a, a name there. Uh, if we wanted to. Uh, so custom dispatch remarks. Uh, again, we have no remarks to add. Uh, right, we can look at the route here. So obviously, Simbrief will pull a route for you, but it will often pull a route that is the most recently used route. That does not always mean that it's the best route. Often it will give you a SID. I'll give you an example, right? So going out of uh, Gatwick the other day on, uh, on Batsim, we were given a SID which was a, a SID off of the runway that we were supposed to go off of. But ATC came back and said, uh, actually, this SID is only valid during uh, night hours. It's not a valid SID during the day. Uh, it was the Seaford departure, uh, which I uh, was already aware of. But uh, yeah, just didn't check the Simbri route before pre-filing. And uh, that's, that's that. So no big deal. They just give you a different SID uh, that is valid. Uh, but it does mean you have to redo your route. So 
Sim Brief is not infallible with the routes. It will sometimes give you a less than optimum route, um, and it's always good to have a little look. So let's just see. So yeah, 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 yeah. So okay, so we have a route there. Let's have a little look here, and it will show you your route is valid. So it is valid for our ARAC. And it's actually quite a good route. So it's plus three point zero percent, which is quite good. So it's pretty straight. If you check that and you see that it's like plus, you know, ten percent plus fifteen percent or whatever, that tells you it's probably not the most optimum route. Um, for your aircraft, and there's a bunch of suggested routes down here, as we can see, valid, yeah, there's one, valid, another one, yeah, blah, 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 so there's a bunch of routes there that have been used by previous Simri users. Um, you can always try and make your own routes if you would like, so usually these find routes, the find SID slash star options here, they are, uh, using Root Finder, which is an online tool. Uh, there are some other tools here um, that you can go and validate your alternates. Uh, if we go up here, you can see there's some links to some useful tools. So it links you to FlightAware, to SkyVector, to Root Finder, Global Root Database. So Eddie Gla also has some routes. Um, so we could actually go in if we wanted to. Eddie Gla is, is quite good, actually. Actually, that has a lot of cool stuff. So, real flight plan database. If we were to go here, I could log in. Believe I have an account. We could go. How the hell do we search? Yeah, use this. It's a while, but. Uh, search. Okay. So let's go departure EGLL arrival BIKF. Contribute to username. Date from. Let's go. Two thousand four hundred three validated. Search. Search. Have a look. We have no results. Not like it, does it? Okay. Cool. So. There are no uh, real-world validated uh, routes there, okay? So, uh, yeah, so we don't care about that. So that, but that's a, it's a good tool. They have a lot of, it's a good database. Obviously, they just don't have that right. Um What we will do, let's do a little test here. So just to show you, if you go to this find route link here and you click it, it will, route finder will do its best to create your route. Uh, over the top of the Simbrief route. So, I mean, that Simbrief route that we had was actually very good. It was pretty, uh, pretty straight, pretty uh, efficient. But let's see what this comes up with, and then we will have a little look. We can also go find Sid Star. Um, maybe it will not be able to create us one that's better than Simbrief's. We'll see. Um, so it's come up with a departure, uh, but we can see it's given us some errors. Yeah, so that is also plus 100%. So it came up with a terrible route. Um, so we will go with uh, the Simbri route. Uh, which is validated the first route, which is perfectly fine because we know that was plus 3.0%. Uh, so that's that's all good. Yeah, route finder came up with a terrible route. Sometimes it's okay. It's not bad. Um, long hauls, sometimes you can refine your route. So really, this is more for... It's useful to consider if you're doing a long haul uh, whether you can get a, a better route and not just in terms of the percentage, but also in terms of the block time. So what you could do is create a couple of OFPs, right? You could generate a few and compare the block time or the air time. Um, try out a few different routes. Try out one from, from this source, one from that source, whatever. Because uh, 
they will often take you slightly differently. Some of them might take you, you know, I don't know, over the UK. Some of them might skirt around the UK or whatever and go over uh, Belgium or Amsterdam or whatever. So there's there's obviously various different ways to get to various locations, right? So um, it's all about efficiency. So sometimes you'll find that, especially on longer flights, you know, maybe you find a route that chops off about 10 minutes. 20 minutes because it actually takes advantage of the jet stream or whatever whereas the other route did not so it's always worth playing around if you've got a bit of time uh you really want to get efficiency uh you know on a long haul flight to try that out um right but that's all good um so we don't really need to dig there uh, anymore um these are the uh these are the boxes for room finder when we were trying to find a route uh, but yeah for whatever reason As you can see though um it does have some useful stuff you can tell it here if it was an oceanic track you can force it to go to a particular nap track um, you can even tell it to avoid certain fir's uh sim brief will will try and avoid like uh dangerous fir's but uh if you Particularly need to avoid a certain FIR, you can do that there. Um, then alternate airports again here, uh, you've told it to. You can customize this, you can say max distance, it's got 400 miles, there you can see this is a, uh, the longest uh, alternate that we have is 417 miles, uh, that is probably Prestwick, uh, because, it's, uh, because it's quite a way back to Try nearest alternate from Kathlovic. Uh, you can see, um, you can tell it the the minimum, I'd say minutes, that's MVDA, the minimum ceiling for the alternate, the minimum visibility. Um, you can set, tell it that. Uh, minimum runway, there you go. Uh, it's already got that there, 7,000, obviously, it, that comes with the 737 profile. Avoid airport. So again, you could tell it, no, I don't want to go to this particular alternate, um, etc. And then you could go find alternates, but Simbrief's already got that. So we're not too worried about that. Um, and we can see here, uh, it's got the alternates listed. Knock, uh, runway 26. Uh, there you go. And it's got a route. It's just... It's got a route there that will take it back, but we'll look at that later. Uh, it's also got there, EGPK, Glasgow Presswick was the second alternate that it chose. Um, and it's got a route there for that too. Um, and then uh, it starts to choose. Uh, please analyze the uh, alternate routes well. Uh, and then it goes on to talk about ETOPS, which we don't really need to talk about today for this flight. Uh, you've got, uh, yeah, all your ETOPS stuff here. Um, again, you can exclude certain airports from your ETOPS. ETOPS is quite a complex topic. I won't go into that in this video, but yeah, it's basically uh, to talk about uh, your aircraft's restrictions, you know, um, what would happen if an engine were to fail out over water. And you have to be within certain time limits to uh, be able to reach uh, a suitable airport. Heading level two. Heading level two. Entry airport heading level two. So you enter uh, at a certain airport and you leave ETOPS at a certain airport. But anyway, that's probably, that's beyond our uh, thing. Heading level two. Uh, airport. You can see it's got heading auto two. here, so it will just calculate that. And you've got ETOPS alternates and blah, blah, blah. But that's, again, uh, it will auto generate all that for you, so don't worry about it. But if you really want to look at all that, you can do that too. Uh, right, so let's scroll all the way back up. So we've got our flight plan, we've got everything set. Uh, so let's go here, all the way back up, and we'll go generate flight. So it generates the flight package, and we'll have a little look. Generate flight. Sim brief downloader, heading level one, sim brief downloader. Clickable. Administrator privileges are required to save the following files. Max square, C, program files, not in preface. Right, so my Simbrief download popped up. Uh, to save that, uh, I will just hit skip because we're not actually going to fly this right now. And let's have a look through our OFP and what is useful and what is not. So, I will just go down and point stuff out to you, I think. Yeah. Uh, alternate. So, yeah, we know that. B737-800. Heading level 2, departure day, 8 of April 24. Heading level 1540 UTC. Punch 1540, as we said. 1838, Zulu is our arrival. 
Our air time will be 2 hours 30. Block time, 2 hours 58. Block time, obviously, including taxi. Heading level 2 airframe. BMDG 738. Heading level 1 flight plan. Heading level 2 initial altitude. So initial altitude will be flight level 340. Level 2 cruise profile. CI 50. CI is 50. Cost index. So obviously, we set that ourselves. Route distance. 1,074 nm. It shows us the total uh, route distance. Heading level 2 average wind. 201 slash 35. Okay, so we can see the average wind uh, throughout the whole flight will be 201.35, so that tells us that the winds aren't going to be too strong for cruise. Level two wind component, P020. The wind component, level two ISO deviation, ISO ISO deviation uh, that can be useful for, we don't have to program that into the uh, PMDG FMC. Level two release, number, one. release number is 1, so uh, that is to tell us, obviously, this is the first time we've generated this particular flight plan. Heading level 2 cycle, 2403. Heading yeah. level 2 layout, Lido. Heading level 2 units, LES. Heading level 2 net log, yes. Heading level 2 meters. Low sheet always in up, then heading level 2. Low sheet always in up. Right, low sheet, obviously, we've probably been through this already in the previous videos, but we'll just quickly go through it. Level 1 link, Lido. Heading level 2 en route burn. So en route burn, 14,687. So that's what we will burn, supposedly, from takeoff to landing, if we were not to have any deviations or missed approaches. So we have 135 passengers. So you can see it's a little bit less than the total capacity mainly because of the uh, weight limitations, probably of the aircraft and the, the amount of fuel we're taking. Level 2 empty weight, 93,175 pounds, heading level 2 estimated FW, 125,575 pounds. Obviously our estimated zero fuel weight, estimated takeoff weight, heading level 2 estimated FW, landing weight, 142,258 pounds, heading level 2 block fuel, 31,870 pounds. So block fuel, as you can see, 31,870. So you can see how much extra fuel we're taking here. Because we have the alternate that was all the way back in Nock or Presswick, uh, plus the extra 30 minutes that I added, plus the reserve fuel, plus the contingency fuel, so a lot of block fuel. Heading level 2 cargo, 6,750 pounds. Okay, so cargo, 32,400 pounds. And payload, 138,300 pounds. That is the max zero fuel weight that we could take or that we could legally have. Level two max tow, max takeoff weight. Level two max pounds. Yeah. Center. Heading level one route. Heading level one link height EGIL slash zero nine. It shows us the route here, of course. You can see three four zero. Direct to umlat. There is an umlat SID. It doesn't give you the SID here, but it would be the umlat uh, whatever uh, SID. So you would find that with the FMC. It's just this route doesn't have it for whatever reason. Well in. Okay, we join an airway to Wellin. UN fifty seven, call. UN six hundred and one, DLA, DCT, Baku, DCT, Ratsu slash N zero seven nine three hundred and forty. Okay, uh, it's confirming there at Ratsu. Our flight level is three four zero again. I don't really know why it's got that again, but uh, I'm, I'm looking through this to see if there's any step climb. DCT, Alden, DCT, Asrun, Asrun three N. Okay, then we go on to the Asrun three November or zero one. So no, no step climbs throughout this route. So we'll stick at three four zero copy. and copy the route. Heading level one, Heading level one link height details done. Link copy. No remarks. Right, then we get into the actual Lido OFP. That was a sort of like abbreviated load sheet. You see, this is all sort of like in a table format. It's the OFP, but there is useful stuff here. So I'll keep going down to show you. There's also a how do I read this there if you want to use that. BBI zero two DW the eighth of April two thousand twenty four GLBI seven hundred thirty eight PMDG seven hundred OFP one Heathrow Cavalry. Hey, OFP one there uh, chose that Heathrow Cavalry zero one five zero eight one eight zero eight two one zero eight zero six zero eight zero eighty CC slash BBI eighth of April two thousand B seven hundred thirty seven CTOT four DG wind two hundred and one slash zero three five. Yeah, there's the average wind there again. So you can see a lot of this has already been shown. This is just in the OFP sort of like I said, in like a table format and they're just a slightly different layout uh, as it would be printed off in the real world. Maximum to 174,900, all this maximum takeoff weight, blah, blah, blah. There you go, FL steps, so it shows us 340. Right, this is quite useful, planned fuel. So you can see trip. Kef, Keflavik, 14,600, which shows us then the time next to it, so 0230 is 2 hours 30. Contingency fuel, 15 minutes, is 1,462 pounds. Alternate fuel, which is not, is 10,005 pounds, is what we would need to get there, which will take us 2 hours and 3 minutes. So you can see why we have so much fuel.
And then we have final reserves, which is 2,205, which is the uh, really the fuel that we should not be touching, really. We shouldn't go into the final reserves. Minimum take off fuel, 28,359. Minimum take off fuel, 28,359. So basically, after you've taxied, that's what you have to have absolute minimum to depart. Extra. 3,011 pounds. So you remember when I did the extra 30 minutes uh, for the uh, extra fuel, that's what we have. So gives us a little bit of a buffer. Take off fuel should be 31,370. Taxi at London Heathrow, there we go, is 500, which should take 20 minutes. So you can see there how, how negligible the taxi fuel is, 500. Uh, pounds of fuel. Block fuel LHR, 31, so block fuel 31870. Thirty one eight seven zero. There we go. FMC info. This is uh, also quite useful. Inres plus alternate is twelve thousand two hundred and ten. Um, why is that useful? Well, when you enter into the FMC your reserve fuel, if you enter that figure, so twelve point two. When you get to the destination and you fly some missed approaches or you fly the hold, it will notify you with a message on the FMC if you reach that fuel or you're about to reach it. And that is basically your minimum diversion fuel. So at that point, you really have to either decide. You could uh, commit to uh, Keflavik. Which means you say, OK, uh, the weather is looking OK, uh, everything looks good. We can probably get and, and land at Keflavik. Uh, we will disregard our alternates. Or you could say, OK, we are close to our minimum diversion fuel. We have to make a decision that we're probably not going to get into Keflavik. We need to divert. So if you pass that minimum diversion fuel, then you're basically committed. Uh, if you are able to to divert before the minimum diversion fuel, uh, then you are you know you're okay. You can fly back to your alternate, but you have to really pay attention to that. Um, so you can see if we go here, log, go back up here. Trip fourteen thousand six hundred eighty-seven. Right. So we know uh, the trip should take fourteen. Let's call it fourteen seven. Right. We also know that uh, total. Log fuel, we have 31.8. Okay, so we can figure out that. Uh, so if we said that was. Trip, well, we, we'll, we'll take the trip plus taxi. Okay, we'll take that. So fifteen one. Okay, um, we've got uh, thirty one uh, eight. So we can tell. Um, call it roughly. We have about. So when when we get to uh, Keflavik, uh, we should have about fifteen sixteen thousand pounds of fuel. We can we could probably get a, a, a actual figure from the FMC, um, but we should have about let's call it fifteen thousand, right? Um, because we and uh, we can figure that out because we know the block fuel is thirty one eight and we know the trip uh, is uh, what was it fourteen point uh, it was fifteen one okay so yeah we can tell that we should have about probably sixteen thousand pounds of fuel when we get to Catholic. Why is that useful? Well, because we can see here our fin uh, Sorry, I went too far down. Uh, it was 12.2. So we can tell that when we get to Keflavik, uh, we should have probably about three, four, probably 4,000 pounds of fuel to play with before we hit minimum diversion fuel. 4,000 pounds in the 7.3 is probably about an hour, maybe, maybe. 40 minutes, right? About an hour. Um, so that tells us that we can pretty much fly several missed approaches at Keflavik. We can probably enter a hold. And we've got between probably, yeah, 40 minutes to an hour to stick around Keflavik before we hit the minimum diversion fuel, where we then have to decide, OK, we are going to um, divert to our alternate, one of our alternates, or we are going to commit to Keflavik. 
Um, so you can work that out during the flight to get a precise figure, but uh, it tells you that we've got that buffer there. Hey, this is just uh, some paperwork bullshit about, uh, I hear with the firm that I've performed a thorough self-briefing, blah, blah, blah. Well, yes, we definitely have. Blah, 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 blah. blah, blah. Kevin somebody who? Kevin Lethley, whatever. Anyway, it's even got a telephone number, which probably won't do anything. Okay, so then it shows us our alternate route. Um, so it shows us alternate route two, and it shows us that we should have our FinRes there. Um, and it shows you, uh, I'll show you what all these numbers are. So the first alternate is uh, knock as planned, uh, and it shows us slash two six. So if we were to divert, we would land on runway two six. It shows you the track, I believe, uh, 138. You can see here, at uh, airport, track, DST, I have no idea what that is, via, which is the route, flight level. Okay, so here we go. So, yeah, track would be 138. That's normally sort of the, the rough heading or track that you would fly, but uh, obviously we have a, a full route. Um, we can see here, this is a SID, I believe, out of uh, BIKF. So we fly the Rimam 1 Alpha SID out of there, DCT, direct to these waypoints here, DCT, and the, the route continues on the next line, so we have to go down. But we can see here also, it, it has the flight level, this is why it's sort of like a table layout, it has the flight level on this top line here, so the flight level is 390, that would be what we would climb to because it's such a long flight back. Here we just have to keep going here. Blank, cello. Direct to cello. DCT, Direct to, again, uh, that is a coordinate waypoint because uh, you probably have to uh, skirt the uh, the ocean. DCT, again, yeah. DCT, Blank, Direct that. Eight, That's a, uh, another point. DCT, 5, yeah. Sorry, five nine north. Five, five, five west. DCT, Those are like eight, higher seven, points, I believe. DCT. Um, but you could program these into the MC, of course. DCT. You could hold and program this uh, route. Because I don't think the the PMDG does not seem to have, the 7.3 does not seem to have a route 2 in uh, MSFS, which is weird. So normally IRL, they would probably take some of the flight to actually uh, spend, the, spend the time to program this into route 2, so that if you had to divert, you could just activate route 2 and go. But uh, yeah, I don't believe... Uh, the PMDG has root 2, so you would have to probably reset this up before commencing the route. Uh, if it's a really short alternate, like if it's a, if it's a you know, like 50, 50 to 100 miles or whatever, and you've got uh, ATC, they would probably just spec to you, to it, to be honest, but uh, since this would be like a two-hour diversion all the way back uh, to mainland, uh, with, in this case, knock. Um, you would have to really follow the route. Blank, blank, Nipeg. So then we go direct to Nipeg. DCT, BP067. DCT, in that. Minefield. Blank, in that 1A. And we finally join the INDAP 1 Alpha blank. arrival for uh, NOC. So that's how you do that. You've also got the same thing here with Presswick. So EGPK, it shows us runway 30. Uh, it shows us the track, 124. It shows us the. Hixum 1 Alpha, so it's a slightly different uh, route Hixum, DCT, Petex. to Petex. DCT, Again, uh, 390. 0 Blacker 1P. Blacker 1 Papa Arrival. So you can see that route is a bit simpler. There's no oceanic waypoints. It's purely uh, land based. Uh, back to Presswick. Blank. So there you go. Blank. If you go down here, you've got the route, so you can see the whole route uh, as we already looked at. Operational impacts. Operational impacts. So these are showing you what would happen if you change some weights or whatever. Uh, it shows you. What would happen if you were to change the cost index between 0 and 100? It shows basically if you were to change it to uh, 
100 the cost index you would gain two minutes if you were to change it to essentially zero or really low um you would uh, i would guess you'd lose five minutes so you can see it's not very negligible oh it's pretty negligible i should say this is a time log estimated schedule so out uh, 1540 Zulu, that is uh, off the gate. Off, that is take off 1600. On, that is on the arrival runway. 1830, yeah, Zulu. In is on the blocks at the arrival gate, which here is 1838 Zulu. Block time, 2 hours 58. It also shows you the maximum block time that it expects, which is 3 hours 15 minutes, obviously. If uh, you would have delays. Wait. Wait again, we've seen all this before really. Hacks, yeah, we've seen cargo, halo, zero fuel weight, fuel, blah blah blah. Terrain clearance, this is also quite useful. Um, so, what we want to look for is the MORA, the most, which is essentially the most critical terrain point. Most critical Mora, 5700 feet at TLA. Okay, so that is essentially, it, it will show you the most critical terrain clearance point. So our flight is going to be pretty flat. There's not many mountains or any terrain around. But it's it's that is basically, if you have to make an emergency descent at any point during the flight, the minimum altitude you should descend at any point uh, during the flight. So 5,700 feet at TLA, which is, I believe, somewhere over Scotland, um, is your minimum altitude, right? So if we were at cruise, the aircraft depressurized and we had to descend, uh, the the minimum altitude really at any point that I would set is probably, say, 6,000 feet, right? We would be would be okay if we were at 6,000 feet, right? But sometimes it's higher. I mean, Europe, you're usually going to be safe. I think the highest point really in Europe is like Mont Blanc or something like that. Uh, which is probably like uh, 20,000 feet or whatever. But uh, generally, you're going to be okay in Europe, right? It's more of a factor in like South America or whatever. This is the flight log. So it will show you all the waypoints you pass over and it will show you a flight log for each one. So here we go. For example, this is umlat. It shows us it expects us to be flight level 180. That may be a bit ambitious. It shows us the track 355. It shows us the MAC number that it expects, 0.59 up, uh, etc. Uh, it also will show us the fuel that we... So this number here, 29.4. That is the fuel that we will have on board, and it shows us the fuel that we will have used, which is 2.5, so 2,500. That is useful because at every, uh, I think it's every 30 minutes, or at least every little while, you're supposed to do a fuel check, so you can check that your aircraft isn't burning excessive fuel. And it shows it's called Umlat, it shows you the coordinates for it, okay. it shows you join the T Tango 420 Railway, Wellin, Cooper, blah blah blah. Now you can see here why this is useful, so here, right, the third line on this one here, it shows you TNT. If you wondered what that waypoint is, for example, uh, the full name of it is Trent right there, okay? It does show you. So if it's a VOR or whatever, you can come and see uh, what uh, the full name of the waypoint is. That's really useful. Happens a lot on Baton, but they more so really in, in the US actually than, than Europe. Like in Europe, they would just say direct Trent, but in the US often they'll give you the uh, identifier rather than the, the full name. Um, it also, as I said, shows you the fuel, so you can check again here if you, if you want to see. Again, it expects us to be flight level 339 at Trent, so still in the climb. Uh, 0.78. Uh, yes, yeah, so we should have 27,500. We'll have used 4,300 pounds of fuel. So very useful as well to do a fuel check. Quite useful on freeware aircraft, actually. Um, if you want to see how bad your fuel burn is, if it's like a really shitty freeware aircraft, 
uh, you can come here and you can check and do a fuel check. Okay. Let's just scroll here, we don't need to see all this. Okay. Right, the next useful bit is wind information. So, have you ever been up at a flight level at a certain waypoint, sat at cruise, especially with the 7-3, and you think, hmm, I wonder what would happen if we climbed? Could we get a better uh, wind situation? Or what about if we were to make a descent? Well, you can actually look at the predicted winds for the various flight levels here. So let's go here. This is your climb uh, to the top of climb. So we're not too interested in that. But it, then it will show you a, a list of waypoints per each section. So this section here is for Ribble, Ergav, Sham, Abivi or Bevy. Uh, let's go down a bit more. See again here, Impib, Utogu, Inrev, Eskdo. Okay, so that is your uh, next section. Let's see. So we were cruising at 340. So here, look, it shows us 380, 360, 340, 320, 300. So it shows us all the possible flight levels, really, that we could want. If we look at 340, it shows us the winds with sort of... Uh, respective values, right? So it's like a table. So it shows us at the first waypoint that we looked at, we were 201 slash 53. The next waypoint is three, that, that's also, I believe, the, the track there. So it shows you, th uh, so not the track, the flight level, 340. 201 slash 53 at the next waypoint, uh, 340 as well. That, that dash 55 is the temperature there. 340 again, 201 of 53. Okay, so the winds are pretty pretty standard, uh, pretty much 53 knots. So then let's say we decided, okay, I wonder if we could, if we did a climb to 380, would it be any better? Well, we can look here, 207 slash 47. Okay, temperature's uh, 52, obviously gets a bit colder up there. 380, 207 slash 47. Okay, so we can see the winds are a little bit uh, weaker up at flight level 380. Um, not by a lot, but by sort of like five knots or whatever. So if you were able to climb, you could have a look at that and you could say, well, let's figure out from my heading whether that would be a tailwind or a headwind, and let's see if it would be advantageous for us to climb or not. Um, you also probably want to look at some of the other waypoints as well going down here. So, you know, there's no point climbing to get a favorable uh, tailwind if it's just going to die off uh, very shortly afterwards. So you could you could have a look here, 380, 27047, 27047, so it looks pretty pretty similar, 340, 21153, yeah, so it all looks quite similar, those waypoints. You could keep looking through your flight plan here. And that's it. So it shows you it all together up here. There you go. It's got Alden, and then it's got top of descent right there. Uh, so it, it groups the waypoints. Each section has like four waypoints, and then it's in a sort of table with the uh, wind information uh, going across. Okay. That's all uh, information for ATC, so we don't really need to look at that. The next thing I just briefly want to look at is going down with headings to the departure airport. Departure airport DLL slash LHR Heathrow show details in Copenhagen heading level one. Okay. Heading level zero nine R. Heading level two elevation eighty three feet. So it shows all this information about the departure runway eighty three feet. Blah blah blah. Heading level two. Weather category. Yeah. Six statute Six statue miles of visibility. Separator. Heading level three. Heading level four. Heading level four. Shows you the meter. Twelve thousand eleven kilotons. Twelve thousand twelve thousand one two zero at some one one not. Heading level three. Heading level eleven ten UTC. Half. So that is the uh, extended forecast. And it actually does have an ATIS from VATSIM, so very useful. So we can check here, information delta, arrival runway 09 left, departure runway 09 right. So simply was correct when it shows 09 right. Okay, so that's there for us. Uh, now, the NOTAMs. What are NOTAMs? NOTAMs are... Basically, uh, yeah, notices to air missions um, for various uh, airports. So normally they are 
just things about taxiways, things about stands being out of use, things about cranes in, in maybe there's a, an obstacle or something in the area. Um, generally, they're not particularly useful, but sometimes there's some, some useful stuff. So you can have a little look here. What do we have? There's one here for the airport. Shows you when it was released. So it's telling you something about uh, entry slash exit at Foxtrot 6. Uh, taxiway center line lights. Out of service, I would assume, or something. Uh, out of service between runway hold point and runway edge lights. Okay, so some, some bullshit about lights being out of service. More about center line lighting. Taxiway, so this is the sort of thing. Taxiway Lima closed at Lima due to whip work in progress. So, okay, if we were going to taxi, we could check that out, but we don't care. Blue edge lights. Blue edge lights. Blue edge lights. So it shows us about resurfacing. Right. Rehabilitation resurfacing on the 3rd of April. Work postponed until the 17th of April. Okay. Interesting. Uh, exit point close. Okay, so nothing there that we need to take into account for this flight, really. Right, arrival airport. Again here. Runway 01, elevation. VFR. Yeah, so. Cab okay. Six statue miles as well. Meta, we've already seen. TAF, we've got one no TAM for this airport, so we can look here. Strobe lights uh, for the runway are, are unserviceable. Okay, we don't particularly care. Uh, it also shows us the alternate, which is NOC, uh, so we could have a little look here. Runway 26, we know. Uh, VFR, yeah. Vis uh, ceiling is 2,000 feet. Meta visibility is all good. Uh, meta, we've already seen. TAF, we've already seen. We've got three no TAMs, so we have a look. Aerodrome hours of service. So you can see here, uh, Monday, actually, it shows us 0700 Zulu uh, to 1625 Zulu. Wow, so this is why looking at NOTAMs is really, really uh, interesting, right? So this aerodrome looks like it could be out of service. Yeah. So there will be no service at NOC from uh, 1625 Zulu, right? So I think that actually means that we probably uh, couldn't uh, use NOC uh, as an alternate, really. We couldn't land there. I mean, probably in an emergency, but... Uh, let me have a little look. So if I just quickly pull up flight radar. And I just go uh, show arrival board. Yep, there are no more arrivals for today. Tomorrow, uh, arrivals go up to 4 p.m., uh, which checks out because at 15.55 it's closed. So. We probably would not do knock as our ultimate, right? So if so, what we've determined here is uh, if we were to have to divert, uh, knock would not actually be a good alternate. See, I didn't know about this, but reading the notams, you see, uh, it, 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 it's it's a it, it's out of service. The the aerodrome is uh, is closed uh, to commercial traffic. So yeah, like I said, probably in an emergency. I mean, I'm sure if you were on fire and you were desperate, you probably could land there, but. Uh, yeah, so NOC would not be very good for us. So we'll disregard that. Let's go down to Alternate Airport Presswick. Uh, we can look here. Fan runway 30, 65 feet, so VFR. Uh, 3,200 feet ceiling. Uh, six, six statue miles. We've seen the meta. Uh, we've got 14 no times here, so let's have a quick look. Uh, light aircraft runway 21. We're not using runway 21. High bird activity. Okay, good to know. Not that it's simulated, but there you go. Uh, instrument approach chart amended. So, 
So something about category A aircraft, which... Oh, oh, these are the minima. So they've changed the minima, basically, on the chart. Uh, we don't really care about that. Altitude, final approach... Uh, uh, fixed altitude is 2300. Right. So we'll, we'll, we would have to probably just check that, make sure that the FAF altitude was correct. Instrument approach chart. 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 They've again they've amended the minima by the looks of it for the different category of aircraft. So yeah, instrument approach chart, blah blah blah. Yeah, we'll just skip past that. So they've basically they've amended the instrument approach chart, and sometimes they'll do this. They'll they'll amend instrument uh, procedures, but instead of actually doing it, uh, maybe they're you know they're not able to do it till the next AIRAC or whatever. They will put it as a no tam. Okay, so all the no tams there are literally all about the amendments to the instrument approach charts. Uh, so that's not a big deal for us. Um, so, but what we figured out there is that knock, yeah, so knock would not be an, a suitable alternate. Okay. So really because the aerodrome is closed. So what we figured out is, okay, if we have to divert to an alternate, we will go to Presswick. And that was good. That's why we have two, two alternates there. Pretty useful, right? So now, uh, if I had only done one, I'd probably go back and regenerate the flight plan, but. Uh, we've got two. We've got the route to Presswick. So we say, OK, uh, we'll just uh, scrap the idea of going to knock. If we have to divert, we have the fuel. We go to Presswick. So uh, that's all good. And um, that is pretty much us briefed. OK, there are a lot of other notes. If we um, scroll, we can obviously download here. Um, if we oh, so now we scroll down, we need to scroll up. But we can see uh, there are a bunch of FIR notams. Do you remember when we told it to give us FIR notams? Um, there are a bunch of stuff here. So, for example, there's one here for Scottish. Uh, DC section extended area, blah, blah, blah. Blank, bird regular fur. Uh, so there's a bunch of a bunch of notes here. Uh, see this lot here. Pipeline inspection notification will take place in the following low flying areas. Blah blah blah. Thames Valley avoidance. Bullshit, bullshit. There's so there's loads of en route no TAMs, right? Most of them will not affect us. Um, it, most of them are not particularly relevant. If there's anything relevant, they'll normally be in the airport no TAMs. You could sit here for hours reading these en route FIR no TAMs and, and not really gain any particular knowledge from it. Um, as I said, one of the things that you will see and that we've seen quite a lot of is this whole GPS spoofing issue. So you'll notice, especially a lot of airports in the Baltic region, uh, even like out to Stockholm or, or uh, into Riga or things like that, um, a lot of the NOTAMs for those airports will be about the possibility of GPS spoofing. Uh, so that is that is there. Uh, even you'll get that sometimes in the Middle East. So that's always pretty cool to, to see. And these are real world NOTAMs. So that's why, um, obviously, like it's it's up to you how much you want to, to go into this, right? Sometimes you, you're not up for a totally realistic flight. We could absolutely say, yeah, screw it. We're going to go and divert to knock or whatever. It's a simulator, right? Who, who cares if it's after whatever it was, 4, 4 p.m. Zulu, the, the aerodrome. On that sim would be open, uh, no one cares. Uh, but if you really wanted to be realistic about it, you could say, well, uh, the, the, I can see with the NOTAMs that that is closed. So that's why NOTAMs particularly are interesting because sometimes it's just a load of bullshit and uh, a lot of it is about taxiways and lighting and stuff. And for a blind pilot, it's like, well, who cares? But occasionally you get one that tells you something like, uh, you know, uh, do not use reverse thrust at this airport or uh, as we saw there, this airport is closed or this runway is closed for whatever reason, so it's pretty useful to keep an eye on uh, the NOTAMs. Um, 
So you can you can always do do a, a little briefing there and have a look through. So that's pretty much going to be it. Um, that's how to create a, a flight plan. Uh, how to do it a little bit more realistically to to consider uh, your alternates and your fuel in terms of weather, in terms of VATSIM. That's another thing to consider for sure. Uh, if you're going into a VATSIM event, maybe you say, okay, I'm going to plan some alternates that are outside of that VATSIM event, etc. Um, it's kind of up to you. But yeah, it's it's just being a bit more considered when you create your RFP, right? Trying out a couple of different routes, especially on a long flight. Like Simbrief did a really good job of creating a route on this flight. And as we saw, I couldn't find an alternate route. I did have a little look on Route Finder. Obviously, it gave me some utter crap. It was a terrible route. Uh, I also uh, tried to look on this uh, Edigla website, which is a real world flight plan database that people upload flight plans to sometimes, but no one had uploaded their flight plan from Heathrow to. Uh, Keflavik. Uh, so yeah, the Simbri route will do us nicely and it was a good route. But obviously, as I said, you could create multiple OFPs and try out some different routes uh, for especially long hauls. Um, but uh, yeah, so just the importance there. Of, of, you, you look what we found out, like we were able to find out that we could go to Presswick as well. We were able to find out that Knock was closed. We were able to plan the fuel accordingly. We've been able to put some extra fuel on the aircraft so that we are in a position to fly several approaches at Keflavik, maybe even hold for a bit, especially because of the uh, gusty uh, winds there uh, for like 40 minutes to an hour before we have to divert all the way back. Uh, we know all about our alternates. We are aware. So, yeah, it's really cool. Uh, I quite enjoy looking at all that. Um, you can also literally just type in the origin destination uh, aircraft type and hit generate and yeah, off you go. Uh, you can do that too. But uh, there's sort of levels to this, and that is how to really get into flight planning. So I hope that was useful. I hope you can take maybe some parts of it. Um, you know, the OFP is a really complicated document. If you were to print it out, I don't know how many pages it would be, but there's so much information here. And uh, to be honest with you, a lot of it is sort of superfluous. A lot of it is not really relevant, um, especially to us in the same or especially to us as blind pilots. But I hope that was useful in sort of looking at what could possibly be relevant uh, and then you can have a look through your OFP uh, and just see what pops out of you. So thanks for watching. I hope it was useful. I hope uh, you get something out of it. So I will see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.